So my name is Renee Bourgeois and I'm with the John Humphrey Center for Peace and Human Rights. I'm excited to see all of you on here and know quite a, quite a lot of you. <clears throat> and of course my voice is gonna start acting funny right when we're gonna get started. <clears throat> but today, this is this, the second session of like the Human Rights 10, 101, 102, this is 102, because um, we realized with moving online, we kind of got to compartmentalize our human rights training a little bit. But what the beauty of that is, it's actually allowing us to go a little bit more in depth with some things. So I know some of you have participated in our human rights kind of complaint training before, but this will allow us to go a little bit deeper and, and to kind of look at some pieces. So we're going to look at the different complaint mechanisms um, for human rights, but we're also going to look at the, the UN reporting mechanisms. After the last session, um, <clears throat> I had a number of folks call very interested about shadow reporting and how do we engage with the UN processes, because I think a lot of the issues that folks are working are, on are very systemic. And so uh, when we're not getting movement in, in our national structures or provincial structures, then, then the international structure provides us a way to report. And um, as we talked about last time, can apply some pressure on Canada for some changes. So and we're also gonna talk about, you know, how does, how do we define discrimination? Um, what are examples of discrimination? Like, what does that look like in terms of national legislation? So if you remember last time we talked about like the larger international human rights architecture and, you know, that there's these different... Um, as I mentioned, there's two sets of communication. Each will be 45 minutes long. And we've given the speakers 30 minutes of presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, the, the international human rights architecture, as you know, protects rights such as the right to housing, the right to food, like all these different elements. But the national and provincial laws around human rights really bind around this idea of discrimination. So we'll talk a little bit more about like, what are the grounds around disc discrimination? What does that look like? And, and then, you know, what are those pieces of a human rights complaint? So before we move forward, I just I just want to acknowledge we are here in Emiskwichi Waskahagan, which is Treaty Six territory, um, otherwise known as Edmonton for many. Um, and I, you know, I I've often been struggling a lot lately with um, these efforts to make statements on things. And when everybody wants to make a statement on something, then it's meaningful. And you know, right now I see every organization is putting out. Um, statements about what's happening in relation to um, George Floyd and the F policing issues, but treaty acknowledgements, of course, are something that have been around for a while. But again, I often feel sometimes it's just a, a stamp for people. And I think what's most important from my perspective is recognizing that as a treaty person, um, it's this idea of being together um, in this journey, but it's also recognizing the historical oppression um, the genocide in Canada and rooting ourselves in that and understanding ourselves in that context and perspective and recognizing that that is alive and well um, in, in so many ways. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that when we're talking about human rights, um, we have to contextualize ourselves within the, the history of where we are. Um, and so part of that is recognizing the history that we live in is really, you know, based on colonization, oppression um, that is still alive today for the first peoples of this land. Um, and I'm just really grateful for having been born into this, this place, um, even though from like a white European ancestry of French and Ukrainian. So I just you know, honor this land and welcome all of you who are here, but also welcome those of you that are maybe in other treaty areas or other territories. Okay, so to get started today, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about things. I think a lot of us are, there's a lot going on in the world as we know. And, you know, a lot of times when people talk about human rights, we talk about them as they're, they're these paper documents and, and what, do, what do they really mean? How do we make them real? And I, I know in the, like the first session, we talked a little bit about, you know, human rights are only as real as our knowledge of them, but also our willingness to engage with them. Um, human rights are only as strong as the people are in coming together. And the more I, I, I grow and I learn, 
Um, the more I do work around human rights, the more I realize that it's the systems and structures that we may want to change, but they are not the space where change happens. They, yes, there's change that happens in terms of legislative changes and stuff like that, but the real heart of change comes from the people. Um, and I think it's up to us to really be able to mobilize together and, and define what those rights mean for us and for our communities. Um, so I, I always kind of like, Miles Horton has this book called We Make the Road by Walking. It's one of my favorite books. And it's this idea that things do, are not fully defined until we walk that journey together. We learn as we go. And in all this work around human rights, I think it's learning as we go, but it's also about um, recognizing that our rights are intertwined with others. And it's recognizing that rights are evolving and dynamic. They're actually really quite young in many respects. So we have to look at them as these evolving constructs. So today, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at um, the UN uh, reporting mechanisms that exist. I'm just gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of, uh, about that. Um, and then we're gonna look at the different complaint mechanisms and the tools that exist that can help you to file complaints, but also talk a little bit more about those protected grounds and areas. So I am going to be moving between my PowerPoint and to websites to show you, because I think there are amazing websites out there that can help you walk through these processes and answer your questions. And I think it's, there's great tools. So I'd like to be able to bounce back and forth my worry, uh, I just want to, this is more of a logistical thing, is Tara, for closed captioning, when I go to websites, um, I need some support. So I'm hoping perhaps, Nexi, if you are open to it, can I um, ask you to do closed captioning when we move to the websites? Is she there? If you can, I will do it. Okay, that sounds good. And and then at that point, Tara, we'll just maybe use the chat, I guess, for at that point for um, closed captioning, just so that we, we don't lose anything. Okay, so that's our plan for today. So let's talk about treaty bodies and, and the Universal Periodic Review. So just uh, briefly, as you guys will remember, last time we talked about um, at the United Nations, uh, there's a number of different conventions that have been passed. Uh, so there's like Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and in all of those elements, in all of those conventions, there are related committees which people can engage with um, as civil society to be able to have input and share what's happening in the country, um, where they live, but also to make recommendations for change. Um, part of that is we have these convention bodies but we also have the universal periodic review and that's uh, the one i'm going to talk about today and kind of use as a framework for moving forward but the universal periodic review happens every couple every four and a half years with the with canada and it's through this process that um i'll show you we can submit shadow reports they're called to these convention committees or to the universal periodic review committee really trying to make the, those involved at the United Nations very aware of the realities of the situations. Um, okay. So just, just before I move into kind of looking at some websites, um, when we talk about these uh, committees at the UN level, as well as when we may talk about the Universal Periodic Review, there are a number of different ways for civil society to engage. And one of those ways, um, is so when a country goes through this process at the United Nations, um, they are obligated to consult with uh, the community uh, that they work with, uh, their, their country, essentially, with civil society in their country to inform the report that would go into the UN. Um, I, those of you that were on the last session will recall I talked about how Canada has often received a very not so great grade in terms of engaging um, and consulting with civil society to feed in these into these reports. Um, Canadian Heritage is the uh, ministry responsible for this um, within Canada. So I'm just going to mute a few more of you. Sorry, catching some noise. So this piece about national consultation. 
it's um it, this is an important place to engage but the trick is the state being open enough and engaging enough so that we actually know to engage um so keeping track of canadian heritage uh and their website is a really good good idea sorry i'm just muting again I'm distracted so the other way that we can engage in these processes is sending information on our country to the to the UN, which is what we're going to talk about. There is also ways that we can lobby members of the working group. That's I think that's a that's a longer term goal. Um, people can also actually go to the Human Rights Council and and um, during during the adoption of a report on a country and speak to that. Um, but then there's also the piece like after a report or a review happens for the country, there's also the monitoring and implementation of that after and really observing it and watching it and making sure that our, our country does what they say they're going to do. Um, so for example, after the last shadow review, um, Canada was told that we really needed to um, embed into our legislation um, inclusion and accessibility uh, for people living with disabilities. So over the last number of years, we've seen um, the development of the Accessibility Act at the federal level to kind of meet those demands from the United Nations. Um, while that legislation is in place, and that's, you know, we're, we as civil society can see that, the trick is then making it real and relevant um, and providing input into that process. Um, and many can, you know, the Accessibility Act itself is not something that's definitely not something that's perfect, but at least it's a start. Um, and so this is my first time doing this presentation. So you guys will see me kind of bumbling a little bit. Hope that's okay. But um, so just some tips in terms of like, say, say we were working on a really systemic issue. So say I'm going to say like child welfare, for example, in Canada, or, or here in Alberta. And you know, the systemic um, elements around that, the, disc the systemic discrimination that exists in child welfare. Um, there are two ways that I could kind of provide input, and that would be into the co committee around the Convention of the Rights of the Child, or I could go to the universal periodic review process. And to kind of get myself started, what would be smart for me to do would be to, one, confirm that Canada has ratified the convention, the relevant conventions that related to the area that I'm looking at, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we're going to look at when maybe the report is due for Canada so we can prep ourselves to organize and, and write these reports. Um, we're going to also, what's really valuable is kind of looking at previous reports um, to Canada on that issue around that convention committee and seeing if there are any other, you know, getting to familiarize ourselves with what, what recommendations have been made to Canada so far and maybe what have they missed altogether. Um, and then there are reporting guidelines for each treaty body, which are pretty similar. So I'm going to review one of those with you today. So this is when I'm going to go to the website. So Angelica or Nexi, if one of you guys can help with that would be great. In the chat. Okay, so the website I'm taking to you here um, is uh, the UN Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner. So this website is like the gold mine for all things related to uh, the UN and human rights, but also to different countries. And you can see when you come on here, uh, you can see the human rights by country. Okay. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> Angelica, I'm reading the chat. I'm like, oh yeah, you're, you're doing captioning for me. Thank you. Um, so on this country, what I wanted to show you was a couple key things. And this is kind of the area, but um, here you can, this status of ratifications, what this is, is this is kind of tells you, and this is one we looked at last session, all the different conventions that Canada has uh, ratified and, and signed on to. So there's, there's that piece. So that's something that will give you a quick snapshot on, um, you know, has Canada signed on? Do they have any reservations to that? Um, at all. So this is a critical piece in terms of knowing what 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 Canada has agreed to be obligated to. Um, reporting status. I'm just going to come to that. Hopefully my internet works well for us today. Slowly but surely. Maybe not. 
So on this one, um, this is a this is a good one. It looks um, maybe hard to see, but if you open up, so say I'm going to pick up uh, the Convention on Elimination Discrimination Against Women. I'm going to open this up, and it's going to tell us when the different reporting cycles are for that committee. So you can see, um, you know, they're going into a reporting cycle. They did a reporting cycle last year um, around the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and in here, what you see is the different reports that were filed. So you can see um, the state, so the Government of Canada's report, which would be linked, there's no link there. Um, I know we can find that on the Department of Canadian Heritage, but we should be able to find it here as well. But you can also see like a submission from Amnesty International and different um, agencies that have submitted these shadow reports to this. So for example, if we as a collective decided to write a report, this is where it would be published um, so that we can see it. So you can look at that for all the different committees and then you can see when the reporting cycle is. So you can see with the Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, you can see the reporting cycle is coming up next year um, and so that they're really probably looking for submissions at this time. Angelica, I'll get that one. So that, that this is an important kind of space to be able to see when, when are those reporting guidelines and, and, and maybe what are people saying, um, what has been recommended. Um, this one is not, the last time we talked about special procedures and you remember those special pro procedures are those rapporteurs, um, those people that kind of come into countries and do more intensive investigations. Um, so there's a little bit of information there. I'm not gonna take us there, um, but this is something that you can play around with. It's this reporting status one, which is really critical. But the other thing I wanted to point out here um, is this section here. So you can see, um, for Canada's Universal Periodic Review, you can go to a space which has all kind of the documents related to this. Um, and then there's also kind of most recent reports that have come through th through those special procedures. So um, you can see those here. And these are really helpful. The other good thing about these reports and what I want to point out is when you're doing advocacy work um, around human rights, uh, this is these reports are really valuable to quote or to refer to to strengthen your arguments. Not only is it really helpful when we're trying to make an argument about human rights to really tie to specific articles of human rights, but we can then refer to these reports, which are, you know, um, informed by both government and civil society and UN agencies. Um, so these are really valuable um, spaces to look for information to really strengthen any sort of reporting that you do. Um, and then here you can see um, any kind of concluding observations or recommendations that have come out of recent reviews for Canada. So you can see there's some reviews recent, you know, in 2018 with the Committee of Torture on here. But this website's just a really great space um, to be able to access that information in relation to uh, Canada. And we head us back here. Okay. So I'm going to take us to one other one. I should close close these as we go. Um, I also want to show you this website. Now, this website is a it's a it's an international NGO that runs this website. It's called UPR Info. And what I wanted to show you here is, and I want to take you from the front screen because I often find like it's not obvious to see where you're going. Um, if you go to how to participate, um, we can go to country page. And and so we're going to go, let's find Canada in here. Where are you? Way down here. This is a great website for like just even little bits of information about things. So this is all about Canada's Universal Periodic Review, which I, I want to kind of dig into. Um, and you'll see, we looked at this last time too, like this is kind of the reporting timeline for, for Canada. So we can see that Canada's at the point where they're actually just doing, probably working on a midterm report to the UN in relation to all the recommendations that were made in 2018. Um, starting like November next year is the target when Canada should actually be out and they should be engaging with us. They should be um, seeking feedback from civil society and, and building their report. Um, at this point, you know, 
things that will go for about six months normally and they'll seek feedback but then by 2022 you can see this is when we as ngos or civil society need to start engaging in writing reports to the to inform the upr now i want to just stress here um I'm going to stress that in a second, just so I can maybe get it on closed captioning for Tara. But this is a really great website too that tells you like all the different you know cycles that Canada has been through. You can look at okay the different the three Canada has been through three times. You can look at you can pull up May and you can kind of see all the recommendations that were made and really make sure to use them and build them. And as you can see on here, you can see that there's the national report that Canada would have submitted to the United Nations. Um, also, the UN will look through all the different convention committees and uh, thing, things like UNICEF and that, and they'll compile information from the different UN committees that will go into this review. Um, then there are submissions that come from, you know, civil society and other stakeholders. And so those would be the shadow reports. Um, and this is what I kind of, I'm going to come back here and I'm just going to put the closed captioning on for, for Tara again. Sorry. Thanks for your patience. I tried. <laughs> no, I, it's hard. It's hard. So I wanted to get this up so Tar could hear this is that um, with these processes, I think sometimes we may wonder, you know, if it matters. Um, but when we think about the Universal Periodic Review and thinking about that, um, the information that the UN gets do these periodic reviews is um, dependent on a couple of these spaces. So one, it's dependent on input from, from the federal government to write their reports. It's dependent on input, as I said, from these different UN agencies, but it's also dependent on people, people, just people, um, these shadow reports, because um, if, this, if civil society isn't submitting reports, shadow reports to the United Nations agencies, then it's really easy for, I think, systemic issues especially to get overlooked um, because the UN agencies, compilation reports and the government agencies, you know, while they're important, they can't be the only source of um, information for, for folks. So, there isn't a lot, as I mentioned last time, there's not a lot of folks that are doing shadow reporting. And you can see from that one that I pulled up around women, there was only four agencies that submitted shadow reports, which is great that we have four, but we should be having a lot more. Like they're, they're, the, you, these UN agencies to be able to make effective recommendations to Canada, they need to hear from us. They need to hear from people who live here and understand it and are engaged in it. Um, so I think I just really want to point that out. And I think something that I'd like to do as a collective is start to work towards this universal periodic review, this next one, and really get things on the table in a meaningful way. So let's talk about these shadow reports and, and, and what, what are the things that we need to know? Um, this is kind of the practical kind of guidelines of what we need to know. And as I mentioned, I've submitted um, a couple in the past. Um, one time as a coalition of a bunch of agencies and one time just as the John Humphrey Center. So the, the big thing that we need to do when we're thinking about these shadow reports um, is identifying, you know, the human rights treaties and really being clear on what are the rights that Canada is not fulfilling in relation to our community. So that's where we can look at different convention documents such as the universal, I won't say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it's more of an aspirational document, but say we pull out the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and we're looking very specifically at that and really pulling out the articles that are relevant to what our concerns are. So if housing is the issue um, and accessibility of housing, we'd really look into these conventions to identify the rights that are kind of being violated and strengthen our argument. And I would suggest this is something that you should do in, an, in any advocacy. When I write a letter to an MLA or an MP or anywhere, I often will draw in articles from conventions because they are international law. And it just, as I mentioned before, if we use the human rights language rather than an approach of partisanship or, or you know, political approach, it gives us greater strength and also makes those that we're trying to make a, be aware or to influence um, a little bit more cautious that what their actions are, you know, they have responsibilities under human rights. 
So that's that connection to the articles and that is really important. Um, they also, you know, say contain credible and reliable information on human rights within the state. So, you know, really looking at the previous review that happened with Canada and looking at how is it developed? Um, how has that evolved? And really trying to pull and back up your information. Um, another thing that you might want to mention in a shadow report is like, how, how did you go about writing this report? So, for example, was it just about, you know, maybe I'm an agency and there's 70 staff in our agency and we sat down and we we organized for three weeks and we documented this. I would just make a tight paragraph on like that. Or maybe I was pulling together, like the, one of the ones I did, I pulled together about 12 agencies in Calgary and we were talking about poverty. And we met over a series of four sessions to kind of build our shadow report. Um, so just kind of like a little bit about who was involved and what was the methodology. And then we want to just dig in and we want to highlight kind of the main issues of concerns. but we part of these shadow reports is not just about being these are all the things that are wrong it's also about pro providing tangible and practical ideas and solutions and i say practical because a lot of times when you look at recommendations they are very amorphous they're very huge there are these kind of recommendations that you're like how the heck does canada implement that it's not it might be um it might be when, when it's amorphous it allows it to not move forward um, so as the, the more practical and tangible we can be in our in our recommendations to the UN, I think the better. Um, they, they, they specifically say do not use abusive language. So I felt like I had to put that in there, although I, I feel like that's pretty self evident, but uh, that, that there's that. And then they also talk about how, you know, we should be using first hand uh, in our shadow report as kind of that information is priority however we can add backup information as end notes and end notes do not count in our total word count which is good to know so so when we're so when i made an um a submission to uh the upr with from just the john humphrey center i'm limited to the number of words i can in, in, include and it's 2815 words a very interesting number um which was about four I think it was about four pages or so. So you know that we have this kind of tight time frame. But if there's a coalition of NGOs working together to submit a shadow report, we can go up to 5,630 words. Um, and it just has to be submitted by a Word document. And super simple, easy, you just email it in. That's it. This is the email. And this, this information is also available on that UPR info website, um, as well as that uh, o, the Office of the Human Rights Commission website. So um, these shadow reports are, you know, really important for us to do, but uh, and really simple. And, and I, I will send this, I'll send this out to you. Um, but also just for more information, uh, there's these kind of websites. So the the upr the office of the human rights C council has its own upr website which you can kind of go look and again look at the the reports that came for canada but then also the un has published this um, handbook for civil society on shadow reporting this is a really great resource it's actually you'd think it's small and i thought it was but it's quite quite large but it's got many sections and the many sections include information on how to report to the convention committees but also the universal periodic review process so it's a really good handbook for that overall picture um, and a good source of information so that is the shadow reporting process i mean i i wish i i think it's it's really quite simple um actually the shadow reporting it's just really making sure that we're um really hitting hard on what the issues are connecting them to human rights articles and then really moving into those recommendations and reflecting on the recommendations that were made to canada previously so it can seem to be a bit intimidating but you know when we did our reporting you know the the key thing i think about is a lot of times people get stuck because they want things to be perfect and if we are going to want things to be perfect that's when things don't move forward so knowing that these shadow reports don't have to be absolutely perfect editorially or whatever but just that we get them in is really important so so that's the reporting and before we go on i just want to just give a second if anybody has any questions or anything about kind of reporting to the United Nations and if there's anything else that I can address. Renee? Yeah? So 
as volunteers of um, John Hopkins Center, would you be kind of checking it first? Because that's our first time. Um, as volunteers of the John Humphrey Center, I think, you know, first shadow reporting, um, we haven't, GHC hasn't actively done before. So wow. it would be something, you know, I, I've done some before, but they were more, they were a couple years ago. Um, but if this was something that we were going to move forward on as advocates and as a collective, um, mm -hmm. definitely we would work together. And definitely, I think it, we would be happy to review if even if some of the you are associated with the NGO that wants to make a submission here and just wants a review, happy, happy to do that. I think that because sometimes, too, if you have other people review it and even say myself or, or some of the other advocates, um, maybe there's alignments with other groups that could happen to really strengthen the sh the reporting as well and just adding people, other NGOs to the, who might be supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. And Jess, can individuals do this or is it more effective to be done by an organization? So yeah, Jess, it has to go through an NGO. That's the only tricky thing with this. So an individual submission is a submission by one NGO. And then the coalition is by more. So for us to do this, we'd really have to find an NGO that aligns with us or and, want, and is willing to put it forward. Um, there's not a lot of organizations in Canada doing this. I know like the Native Women's Association of Canada does do shadow reporting and Amnesty International and that, but I don't know a lot of NGOs that are doing it. But you can know that, uh, you know, JHC is here for this reason to like strengthen our, our rights claims and efforts. So um, if you're wanting to kind of work on one, I would suggest check in, check in with us and we can, maybe we can support you in that process of evolving it forward. Because I think in some ways with shadow reports, it'd be a matter of some of us just really kind of having that time to come together and flush it out and, and co-write and, and, and build. And I think there's a lot of issues that need to come forward. And like, I know there's one gentleman who's really wanting to do, for example, child welfare. Um, so it's kind of finding then those organizations to put through. Sorry, that's a really long answer, Jess. I, I, I can tend to ramble. <laughs> okay. All right. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to move now into the complaint side of things and complaints. Oh, this is the fun stuff. So, um, as you know, from our, our call last time is there's three kind of levels uh, of complaints. There's the United Nations level, there's the national level and the provincial level. And so when we talk about, um, the provincial and the national level, it's really, as I mentioned before, wrapped around this concept of discrimination. And we'll dig into that a little bit more in a bit. But the UN, the UN Human Rights Council is a little bit, you know, more open, if that makes sense. It's, it's, you know, if there's issues around specifically the right to water, complaints can be made about that, for example. So let's move into that. Um, okay, so I do want to go to a website again quickly for a second. Uh, but this is, again, we're kind of back to that UN Human Rights Council. Uh, website again a really great site I'm just going to move us there really quickly um, Angelica I'm hoping you're hoping you're ready okay um, we're just going to head back to this website okay so what I found with all three of these levels of complaints is we have pretty solid simple approaches the UN Human Rights Council complaint procedure is the easiest of all of them um, and on this this page you and when when we send you the powerpoint the links will be right at right connected to the uh the image so you'll be able to like link right into it but the hu the human rights council complaint procedure um is very quite simple and this is a, a site that you can kind of come to and look at and get more information and it tells you kind of where to send them again it's it's uh it's email and it's by a very simple Word document. And I'm going to show you this Word document right now, just to show you how simple it is. And, and, and if you have any questions about it, we can talk it through. Oh, shoot, I'm missing chat. OK, that's Angelica. Um, so this is, this is the form for the UN Human Rights Council. Um, you can submit it in any of those official languages, so Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, Spanish, um, and you can correspond in any of those. And the key thing here, it says, is not to exceed eight pages. Um, that's not including any attachments, however, 
And again, they always stress this, please do not use abusive language. Um, so here you can see, um, so what is the information? Are you submitting, you know, who are you? Are you an individual? Are you a group of individuals? Maybe making a collective approach? Are you an NGO? And you'll just kind of provide, of course, the basic information here. Um, you can, um, file on behalf of others here, um, just so you know. Um, and then we come here to like the information of the state. So you're gonna name the state that's involved, maybe the public agencies that are involved. So say for example, I wanted to address policing in Edmonton. I would say, you know, Canada, the government of Alberta, um, city of Edmonton, Edmonton Police Service, I would kind of name like the relevant public agencies that are responsible for human rights under that. And if you remember last time we had that, that concentric circles document where we talk about like the child and all the different levels of responsibility that have responsible rights around that child is that there are different agencies. Every public government agency has a responsibility to uphold rights. And so we can include them in that. So now here we kind of go into just providing in detail or, or in chronological order kind of the allegations like what happened so what are the dates what happened you know um how you consider the facts that circumstances describe violate your rights um so this is the area where you can just like get it out um and i'm really going to encourage you again please don't feel the stress to be perfect just get it out these things can evolve as you go in some ways too like the key is to make sure that we kind of get it in and having people review it is great um, but really kind of chronological order writing things down as an individual uh, you can make a complaint as i mentioned like sandra lovelace and had been one of the ones that impacted the indian act um, and she really, it was an individual complaint and um, she was able to document her own individual case. However, say we had like, say for example, the 30 seniors that I have up in Slave Lake who have issues with the health system and with ac access to language rights. Um, with, e with that, there, it's more of a systemic approach where we could kind of articulate, you know, the individual instances that happened with people but also more the systemic stuff so this is just kind of a really it's it's telling this story um and the trick is i think just to be tight clear connect to human rights articles and conventions again in that space the other pay, pay thing they ask for is like so what did you do like did you exhaust your domestic remedies because the intention of the human rights council is to be that kind of place of last resort that you've tried maybe the Alberta Human Rights Commission, that you've maybe, you know, went through the mechanisms that you've needed, but you could not get remedy. Um, and that's what happened with Sandra Lovelace is she had went through her provincial commission or her territorial commission, went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and then went to um, the UN Human Rights Council. So there, it's like this, this kind of process that happens. Is sometimes with do like systemic cases, however, it's not going to be that easy. Um, but it's just about saying what what have you done, if anything. Um, the other question they ask is, have you have you made any other submissions to any other UN bodies? And if so, kind of tell us about that. Um, and then finally, the simple kind of stuff is like request for confidentiality. Um, so making sure if you, you know, to have that confidentiality you sign here. And then it just tells you like what to include in, in your communications. So say, say maybe you did go through a tribunal process in Alberta, you could kind of keep copies of that and, and include it. Um, so any kind of evidence happens here. So as you can see, aside from like this piece around really articulating the issue and what's happened, this is a pretty straightforward complaint um, procedure form and I think pretty user friendly. Um, and we'll make sure that you have, it's right on the website, but we'll make sure you have access to that. Okay. Oh, it's still going. Oops. See, it's linked and I'm clicking right on it. That doesn't help. Okay. And I've already went to this. See, I always get ahead of myself in my slides. Um, okay. But so are there any questions about the UN related complaint procedures at this point? Because I think most of the time I wanted to send more on the national and the provincial, but feel free to ask me if you have any questions. 
all these things we have to move around on our desktop. Okay. Awesome. So that's the UN Human Rights Council. Pretty straightforward um, complaint process, but really good to know about. And again, another kind of procedure that maybe isn't used. I think a lot of times maybe people get... Renee Taylor has a question. Yes, go for it. Okay, um, I have a question about, um, is it mandatory to go to like, say the Supreme Court before going to the UN or is they just want to know what uh, recourses you take before you have them? Yeah, so they do want to know what recourses you have taken. Um, there, my suggestion is, yeah, I think they're always kind of looking at maybe you, you've at least tried the human rights instruments that exist in Canada. Going to the Supreme Court, though, not necessarily needed um, because that's inaccessible. And I think um, one of the things that can be said in a U UN Human Rights Council complaint would be the fact that um, the access to justice um, using these national human rights, like the Supreme Court, is not accessible for all. While the human rights commissions are accessible, generally, um, the Supreme Court and the justice system itself is not an accessible system. So I think they want to make sure that, that you see that um, there are these domestic systems that you can use and that you've maybe uh, tried the provincial commission or whatever. Um, but if you haven't went into courts or anything like that, that doesn't stop you from filing with the UN. Um, but what I would do, would art I would articulate in my complaint, maybe why I haven't used the legal system itself <clears throat> and just articulate the fact that Canada has a real problem with access to justice um, and access to legal support. So I hope that answers. Okay, thank you so much. That's very helpful. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move into the national human rights instruments. And as I, as we kind of talked about last time, when we talk about um, the human rights inst instruments, like the human rights commissions in Canada, um, they're really in this framework of looking at human rights as discrimination only. So you'll notice on that, that UN Human Rights Council complaint procedure, you could kind of articulate complaints or violations around things that they might not consider discrimination, although we can probably make the case that a lot of things are. So for example, say um, a community, the Lubicon Cree, for example, have not had water for decades. Um, that actually people from the Luba Concrete could file a, a complaint together around something like access to water um, as a rights violation. I think that you could make the case regardless that that's discrimination, systemic discrimination in Canada um, and complaints could be made to the Federal Human Rights Commission, but I don't think they would see that. They're really looking at those individual cases of discrimination. And when they talk about discrimination, what they mean is it's an action or a decision that results in the negative treatment um, of, a of a certain group of people. Um, and so it's like really being able to articulate, if I feel like I'm being discriminated against because I'm a woman, I really need to be able to articulate and understand how I am being treated different than the others that I'm working with, for example. So we've really got to kind of find that, how am I being treated different because of my identity um, is the really critical piece of this. And that's what the Human Rights Commission is going to be really looking for, um, especially say if in an employment case, they really want to see how you have been treated differently than others and, and how do we make the logic that it's based on a specific identity characteristic? Renee, I have a question. Yep, go for it. So let's say in your um, example there, right? Um, you know, you're being treated differently because, you know, you're a woman and um, maybe you're a mother, things like that. However, let's say the company is really large and you see other, you know, managers across the company, maybe in another province, or if it's a huge company in the U.S., they don't treat other women with mothers the same way. So what is your recourse in that, that sense where your manager in maybe Alberta is treating mm -hmm. women that way? So my sense is that if it's, a, if it's an agency that has branches 
outside yeah. of Alberta as well, then it would, pro it would lie under federal jurisdiction. This would be an interesting one to see where they lie and just determining where it's federal or provincial jurisdiction. Wow. But when it comes to family, like those family rights and that piece around being mothers, for example, and having that's what that is, is it's called family status. So wow. there in that case, there's also precedent law um, around the human rights. And, and there, for example, um, with CN Rail, where according to human rights law, all companies have an obligation to accommodate um, based on family status. Meaning if you're a mother and if you have childcare duties, or even if you're taking care of you know, your senior parents, the company has an obligation to work with you to try and find accommodation. Now, this is important. I didn't build it into the slides. And I think I'm glad you brought you kind of bring this up because this piece about reasonable accommodation is, is really important to, to know. You need to know, people need to know that regardless of what it is, whether it's you have a disability or maybe you, your, you know, um, your mother or maybe you're, you have, you know, other barriers that it is the obligation first of the employee to go and to ask for the accommodation. So I'm a mother, this schedule's not working for me. How can we work together so that it, we can find a mutual, we can find that it works for both of us. Um, in the case of this case with CN Rail, um, Denise from Jasper, um, they had laid her off. They, they wouldn't work with her um, to, to accommodate her family status. And she took it all the way um, up to the, the, the federal commission. Oh wow, um, what year was this? Oh, Denise, it was like, I could tell you, I'll, I'll find that for you. It's like early 2000s, but it was kind of like a precedent setting case and the fact that companies have to accommodate for family okay. status. And if an employee does go and asks and said, these are my barriers, this is what I maybe need to be accommodated and how can we work together and is collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, then the company has an obligation to work with you. If All they right. just say, sorry, you can't do it then uh, that's a human rights complaint um, right there. They're, they're discrimin discriminating you on family status. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some precedent law around there. But in, in that case, say you're a woman and you're being treated then all, differently than all the other women, it's kind of, why is that? Is it, is it based on like your, where you are, you know, like maybe other identity characteristics or, mm -hmm. you know, where yeah it'd be kind of that it would be interesting one I feel like I can't give you a straight answer for because it's a bit more complex but it would be really trying to identify you know how are you being being able to articulate and document how you're being treated differently than those other ones and being able to take that forward mm -hmm. and if you yeah that's that's an interesting one I feel like I can't answer it directly but I hope some of that stuff helped go yeah. for it Sarah thank you mm-hmm um, I have a question. What, okay, this is not employment at service providers. Mm -hmm. What if they decide to accommodate you in a further, more discriminating manner? Oh, that's interesting. So they, they, you've reached out, you've asked for accommodation, they've tried to accommodate, and it's been worse. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, in that case, I think yeah that's an interesting one and i think it would be about taking it back to them but you but i think and if they refuse to kind of accommodate the thing about service providers employers whatever is that there is a little loophole in the sense that reasonable reasonable is the word that's the the loophole um so if i as an employer feel like it's going to be way too much of a burden on me as an agent as a as a as a employer or an, uh, a service provider to accommodate someone, um, I can kind of get through this loophole. But the trick is for the employer or the service provider to prove that it's too much, too much. Like, so for, I'm trying to give an example here. Say, say, um, well, here's an, like, say for example, somebody, I always kind of the, the the ones that come to my mind are always employment related and I, but I think they can be kind of translated. So for say for example, um, I have five employees and uh, four of them 
are of a specific religious background that they need um, these days off and they all want it. As an employer, I am put in a really interesting position because then I only have one person who can do the job during that time. So that I could say, mm, I can't accommodate that, but let's find a different way. With service providers, I, I think in that case, Tara, you know, I think it's about communicating back to the service provider that it's not working. And if they refuse to kind of take that next step, if it, and I know you, I mean, I'm sure that it's probably not asking for the moon. It's, it's probably asking for a very simple accommodation. And if it's a very simple accommodation that really there's no reason that they shouldn't be accommodating it, then it, then it should be considered as a human rights complaint. Absolutely. Um, so a long answer to your question. But. Sorry to throw a loophole at you. No, it's good. This Thank is this stuff because it's like talking through these things. And you know what I find with it, sometimes it's not always black and white, but it, but it can be black and white. It's just part of this stuff is really being able to articulate and document. And the burden of evidence is always the trick and really like, okay, I went this day and I asked for this from the service provider and this is what they did. And then I went back and I asked for this and this is what they did. And just, it's like, just really kind of the documentation piece. And when we're talking about discrimination and that as well, it's being really, some of the things that we need to be attuned to is that we need to be able to show how we think it's discrimination. So for example, if it's race-based, it's really kind of paying attention to the language that people use and stuff like really being able to capture things like language um, is a really critical piece of being able to document. Okay, let's okay. Drive. Thank you so very much. No problem. And look at here we are some examples of discrimination. Um, so here you can see some examples include like denying someone goods, services, facilities or accommodations. So, um, so for example, in the case that Tara brings up, if somebody, a company can't just refuse and deny somebody an accommodation because they're they have a, a specific need or, or a difference um you know it was interesting i know a couple of years ago there was the case in quebec about a, a, a i think it was a, a a gay woman who was upset that she couldn't get her hair cut in a male salon and she filed a human rights complaint i do believe that was dropped in the end um but th but that's one the denying of services and i think i brought up last time too that bank of montreal case in in vancouver um th that these indigenous folks were denied service and and this is a a really a big one um refusing to employ or continue to employ someone or treating them unfairly in the workplace is something this is probably the most common area of complaint um, to be honest into the commission um, often a challenging one to um, prove but it's really about being able to document I, I always suggest people who are having issues in the workplace and they're seeing this is really start to journal and document it so that you can see it too clearly um, as you walk through and then you have a really solid complaint when you're able to articulate dates and this happened and so and so said this um, I think that's that's really helpful. Um, following policies or practices that deprive people of employment opportunities. So, but say I have some, a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, in terms of you know your example there with employment again. So, let's say you know you have your journals, you have your evidence, and you know you start with I think you say the Alberta Tribunal, right? Um, but in terms of from your experience, like Edmonton and Alberta is such a small place, right? If you launch something like that, like how do you, you know, kind of still have employment in a later time when, you know what I mean? Like maybe that's a giant company you're against. Like what's your experience with that? How, how does the person have a, the courage to do that? And what's the repercussion to and know, the safety. livelihood? Yeah, this is huge, Grace. Actually, it's really huge. you just reminded me of something else I wanted to tell you guys, because another element of the Alberta Human Rights Act and the Federal Human Rights Act is if you file a complaint against your employer or somebody, but particularly it's around employment that we find this is happening, and there is a negative result for you as an employee, uh, that is another um, element. <laughs> they can get in more trouble, if that makes sense, um, in which doesn't mean it defers everybody and companies from treating somebody differently once they've filed a complaint and i think this is a real issue there isn't a lot of safety 
some time yeah. around this, but um, you say you filed your first complaint and you were being treated differently and then something happened. Then you file another complaint and you say, this is as a result of me actually filing the complaint and they get, they can get in a lot more um, trouble, but it's, it, it, it is a real issue. And I think in relation to that, in some ways it's about um, having supports and uh, like advocacy around you to make sure that you are supported. Um, but I don't have a, I wish there was a better answer to this one because it's a, it is a huge issue and I know especially for big companies they're they're not interested in working with people sometimes they're just interested in getting moving and um so just so you know there is that piece um that and and it could be something that you could say is like you know if, if as a result of my complaint this is what's happening and now you're just making it worse for yourself um, but yeah so so these are, yeah, you can kind of see some of those, those other kind of examples of discrimination here. And then you see the bottom one is that, that retaliating against a person who filed a complaint. Um, is at the bottom there. Okay. So when we talk about Human Rights Act, the one thing that uh, the Human Rights Act at the federal and provincial level, um, there are these things called protected areas. And, and what this means, these are just the kind of identity indicators that we have that we feel that we're just being discriminated against and about. So, um, so I may be feeling discriminated about my race. And I think that's pretty straightforward and religious beliefs, uh, straightforward gender, gender identity, um, gender expression. Um, they've really kind of expanded that notion of gender inclusion in the acts to make sure it's not just about like, you know, it's not just about sexual preference or whatever. It's it's much bigger than that. Um, there's identity and expression. There's physical and mental disability. There's age. Now, age was a fairly new one, believe it or not. That was uh, brought in last year in the Alberta Human Rights Act, thanks to some incredible advocates in this province. Um, ancestry, very kind of similar to race in some ways, but it might be because maybe because I'm French or, or maybe it's because I'm Ukrainian uh, that I feel like I'm being discriminated against. Um, place of origin, kind of very similar, like maybe, I, uh, maybe I've immigrated from the United States and I'm treated like a piece of crap because I'm American, you know? Um, might be a common thing that happens in Canada anyway. <laughs> um, marital status, um, source of income, really kind of important one, I think, and one that I don't think gets used very often, but it's this, this was really put in to kind of protect people who are doing, maybe involved in um, the sex trade, or maybe your source of income is age, for example, you know, you can't be discriminated against about where your money comes in to, from, because yeah, we just create all these barriers for people. So that that is a really kind of important one, I think. Family status, I kind of talked about there, like it includes that idea of being parents and child caregiving, but it also means about family caregiving. Like there's a bigger piece of that. So family status is a pretty important one, um, a one where a lot of the case law is really evolving and building. Um, and then we have sexual orientation. So, so when we are submitting a human rights complaint, we need to choose not, you can pick more than one. You can say I'm being discriminated against because I'm woman, my gender, I could be discriminated against because of my, my um, racial background and maybe I have a disability. So I'm gonna put all three of those in there um, and as places of, of uh, discrimination you need to be thinking about like how how to justify that in some ways and how again how you're treated differently than others and maybe there were things that were said to you um, that make it really clear or maybe you're the only indigenous person working for this agency and it's very clear that you're being treated than from everybody else but it's really kind of trying to articulate this so you'll always be asked this protected areas when you fill out a human rights complaint okay now, what are the elements of a complaint? Um, so you're gonna need to the specific grounds of discrimination. So like race, sex, disability as the previous slide. We're gonna identify which jurisdiction it falls under. We'll talk about that again in a second. So not everything is under provincial, not everything is under federal. Um, and I'll, I ha I'll talk about that in a second. The other key piece is it's like, how are you discriminated against? Give a detailed description of what happened. And then how has this had a negative impact on you? These are the core elements and we'll, I'll keep building on these as we, we move forward. So coming into the jurisdiction piece, this is kind of where we kind of, sorry, you can see like the one side is federal and one is provincial. I'm not good at 
PowerPoint to make it more beautiful for you. <laughs> um, but you'll see at the federal level, um, you know, we have crown corporations, uh, you know, communications at the national level, all those things that lie within the federal jurisdiction, the RCMP, um, those pieces. Under the provincial, it kind of covers most of it kind of will come under the provincial, but that's anything under provincial legislation like healthcare, education, and pieces like that. But in the act, it describes the areas um, as being, you know, statements, publications, notices issued out in public. So for example, um, I think it was like two years ago, there was a gentleman in Edmonton distributing flyers that were anti-Muslim, um, anti anti-Islamic, um, and they were distributing them across Northern Edmonton. That is a violation of the Human Rights Act because it's, it's clear discrimination against a group and it's publicly being pushed out there. I mean, when there is a point where it's public incitement of hatred and maybe calling people to action against a group, it then may start to cross the line from a human rights complaint into criminal activity and under kind of the hate crime law, hate crime laws at the federal level, anything that's about real public incitement and action against a group moves into the criminal law territory. It can go under Human Rights Act, but you, you know, there's the two avenues that you can go with that. Um, good services, accommodations, facilities that are generally publicly available. So say I was trying to go to McDonald's and I was denied service, I would go under the Provincial Human Rights Act, even though it's a, an organization that's across the country and across the world. Um, tenancy, housing. This one's really hard to prove. Um, a lot of times, a lot of people will say, you know, I went to go look at this place and they had one look at me and oh, all of a sudden it wasn't available anymore. Um, so tenancy is another area where uh, there's protection. Um, employment practices, we've kind of talked about that, the different, you know, in, in ways that, you know, there are practices within employment spaces that may be discriminatory and that can be quite broad. Mm -hmm. Employment applications or advertisements. So I can issue an advertisement for a job and say I only want this kind of person, for example. I have to, it has to be open to all um, to be able to be in line with human rights legislation. Um, and then membership and trade unions and employers organizations is also another thing. And I think that's an interesting one. I, I, I feel like unions are something that are coming up a lot for me these days and I need to learn more about. Um, so that gives you an idea of kind of like where to file. Um, and I'm gonna show you a website which will help us kind of take into that. And I'm gonna hopefully, so I'm just giving you a warning, Angelica, we're gonna go move to, uh, we're gonna move to the Federal Commission's Human Rights website. And this website, I will tell you, and maybe I sell, sound like I'm a sellout, but the Federal Human Rights Commission is a solid, incredible organization. The people in that organization are, fighting hard and I especially with the current chief commissioner that we have um, I have found since she's come on board a couple years ago that she's very public with calling out the government reminding them on a regular basis about the discrimination of First Nations children's education child welfare like she's on it and powerful and so they're really working hard to make um, the human rights process easy and so I want to take you through this website because I think it is a great first point to go. Even if you think it's provincial law, it's a great first place to go to, to look for stuff. So you'll see here, um, I just came kind of right to the front page and I come to complaints. And it, when you, you hover over this, it has a few different things. But this one is a, this page is fantastic. It's so like, so maybe you this kind of has different scenarios that you may have. So say, you know, you want to file a complaint about accessibility. It'll give you a bit of information about where, what they, where maybe is the best place to file your complaints. The interesting thing at the federal level is anything related to transportation for some reason, well, and telecommunications gets filed into the Canada Transportation Agency, which I find is, um, a bit problematic and I think there's some people really trying to advocate for that to change because it's like the police like police complaints going to the police it's like you're investigating yourself which often does not help um, say for example this one I want to file a human rights complaint um, against a retail store um, it tells you okay that one's under provincial jurisdiction um, 
maybe it, you can see here they have a d m number of different scenarios and I, I like filing a police officer complaint. This is just a really good little page to like be able to come to and say, okay, this is where I need to go file a really central space. I really, I love this page. So, and this, so this kind of section of the complaints is the one that's really great. And what I love this one is I want to complain. Okay, so this takes you through a quick question by question about um, a specific case. So say, they'll say, what happened? So I was, um, you know, I was harassed. And then it'll take you to the next step. Did it happen on a reserve? And I'll say, eh, no. Um, and the reason for this, just so you know, did it happen on reserve? Is if it happens on reserve, it immediately goes under federal jurisdiction. Um, all kind of on First Nation or Métis settlements and that, all, well, First Nation goes, it goes um, to the federal level. So who were you dealing with? You can pick, okay, I was actually at the hospital. Um, and why do you think this happened? And it tells you those protected grounds and you can select one or more. And I'm gonna say it's my age and my orientation. Where did it happen? Okay, it happened in Alberta. And it just takes you through this whole process. And then it tells you, okay, based on your answers, this is where you can go. Go to the Alberta Human Rights Commission and it connects you right there. I, I just think their process makes it really, really simple um, and helpful for just the everyday person to use. Um, now, in terms of like how to file a complaint, um, how to file a complaint, they have um, kind of all the information. I'll go into some of this stuff a little bit more in a bit, um, but they have an online reporting system. Where is it? <laughs> I want to complain. Um, they do have an online reporting here. Okay, so it talks about kind of all the different pieces, but um, what and how to file. Sorry, team. Okay, I'm not finding it right now, but I will find it for you here when I'm saying this is easy to use, but they have a very simple, they have a, a very simple online form uh, for complaints and um, And they also have like a PDF fillable word form, which can be used. So um, yeah, I find, yeah, the Federal Commission is a really great space to kind of go and find your path. Which way do I go? Um, and so we'll make sure that you can, you know, have copies of the, the, the word form for the Federal Commission, um, but we'll also, uh, you know, make sure you have this, these slides to connect in and know where to go. And I will find that direct link to the, the complaint form on here and, and include it in here. I just don't wanna spend too much time. So with that, now we're gonna move to the provincial uh, level and see again, this is the beauty of those links, uh, it takes me there. So now we have uh, the provincial level. And I, again, I know I'm kind of, maybe it's a pain to go to the sites, but I think it's, I wanna show you the sites because I wanna show you where to look on the sites. And so the provincial, Commission, by the way, they would really love to find somebody who could help them build a new website. So if anybody has any ideas um, or knows anybody, I'm sure I could connect you in there because it's something I know they've been wanting to do for some time. They don't have the greatest website, but they are slowly doing it. Um, what happens after you file a complaint? Jasmine, I'll come, I'll come to that later. That's kind of, and then there's kind of a, a quite a large process and we can, if we have some time at the end, we can get to it, but otherwise our next session will all be about like that process because you, there's potential for conciliation and, you know, can go through tribunals. There's a couple of different ways it can happen. So um, that will be the focus of our, our next session. And, but if we have time today, I'll try and come to it. We're, we're kind of, I'm consuming all the time. I got to hurry. Um, so I want to come to this one with the Alberta Human Rights Commission. I think the important for you thing for you to know with this one is to come to this complaint form one right here. That's the kind of key one that you want to come to. You can kind of look through this other stuff if you want and you can read the Human Rights Act, but I think this is the, this is the one I want to show you. Um, so the Alberta Human Rights Act, they've just added this new piece to their website, kind of trying to, I think, follow the Federal Commission, where you can kind of go through a quick self-assessment. One, you know, did it happen within the last year? Um, yes or no? Um, you know, must it fall under provincial jurisdiction? It's got a little link here so you can kind of look at that. If it ha you know, happened in Alberta with an Alberta organization, yes or no? Um, and then they have two more questions. You know, did it, did it take place in any of these areas? So we talked about that tenancy and those sort of things. Um, and were you treated differently based on any of these protected grounds? 
And then once you kind of get through that, if you answer kind of yes to everything, um, you can download the complaint form right here um, and, and walk through it. Now, the provincial complaint form is pretty, yeah, it requires it to break down. It's pretty straightforward and um, quite simple. Um, here, I'll just kind of pull it up here to show you. And they, so they have this guide, it's quite a long guide, but it kind of takes you through, and they just updated this like a couple months ago, so it's, it is up to date. So it takes you through that process of like, how do I, what is the complaint process, um, those kind of things, and kind of all the areas around protected grounds. Um, I'm just going to kind of drive us through here so we can get there. And in this too, Jezrin, they'll have, <laughs> they've changed it on me. Um, Okay, and we have these forms that they have, but essentially what it will do is it's going to ask you like your basic information, but essentially they're going to ask you pieces about the complaints. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint slide because I think I have all this stuff in there. Um, but at least you can, you know, you can go to the commission website and see directly where you need to go and you can download the form. And the nice thing about that is that form, you know, then is the most up to date form. Um, okay. So here we go. Let's drive into like what you need to know and what you need to include. Um, so the things that you need to know about the human rights acts and filing human rights complaints in Canada and provincially is that you have 12 months um, to file. So say something happened in September, 2019, I have to file by that date, September, 2020 for it to be considered. Um, that can be hard sometimes because I think some people will sit on things a little while and think about it and then they'll decide to move forward. Um, but it's, you know, you do have that year window. You can also file complaints on behalf of someone else if you have their complaint. Um, I've done that before, for example, with some seniors where I filed on their behalf and then I become the point person that's having to deal with the commission and kind of uh, support uh, the other person. There's no fee to file. Um, the other piece that I think is really important is everybody seems to think that you need a lawyer to go through these processes. You do not need a lawyer to go through the Human Rights Commission process, nor do you need a lawyer to help you fill out the form. What is helpful, however, kind of like we were talking about shadow reports, is that um, do have somebody else look over it to make sure it kind of hits the point and then it, that it's clear. But legal help has costs and what you need to know is when you submit to the Human Rights Commission, it, again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's accepted to move forward, then the Human Rights Commission lawyers then support you um, through, through the process. So that is what they're there for. You don't necessarily need to have your own lawyer um, to do that and just makes it a little bit more accessible. And that's the whole point. Um, you can call the commission and ask for help. I do I do, I am a bit more reluctant to call the commission because I, I know, and I know former colleagues who've worked in the commission have told me, you know, part of the commission's goal is to be gatekeeping. Um, and if somebody isn't able to fully articulate their case on a phone to somebody in a way that the commission understands it, um, they can often shut the door before you even get ahead. So I always kind of recommend drafting it and putting it together. Um, you can call them, but it's just, if you call them, don't get discouraged if they kind of sh shut you down. Engage with some other folks to have the conversation about it. Um, as I mentioned, the commission is, is you know, they, they're there to support you once your, your uh, complaint is kind of approved to go through the process, but they are meant to be impartial. Um, but the key thing about it too is just keeping it really tight and straightforward. Um, a lot of times people can go into the emotion rather than into the practical. And when we go into the emotion, we can become very angry in our complaints. Like I often will see a letter that's to somebody, like a, the police, and it's an angry letter because of something that happened. But a letter that is written in that way does not and will not get you through to the next level. It is not going to get you what you need. A lot of times it's just going to shut the door. So it's really about being practical, and remove your emotions from it and make it make it and I think that's maybe why the UN Human Rights Council one says no abusive language is really keep it succinct tight and to the point and don't get into um, the emotional part of things not that that's not important and I think 
one of the things that you can stress in a human rights complaint is the fact that it does affect your emotional and your mental health. And that's something you'll articulate in the uh, complaint to say, this is how it's affected me. So when we think about a human rights complaint, these are the core questions. This is my last slide that we're going to, that you're going to think about that you need to be able to answer. Um, so the first one, the first, and this, these are the questions actually pretty much within the Alberta human rights uh, complaint. So what happened and where did it happen and when? Pretty, pretty simple. What jurisdiction does the complaint fit? You just have to be really clear on which jurisdiction so that you can file it to the right commission. And both of them are very similar forms. Um, but you can also use that federal uh, website to kind of help you decide what just jurisdiction it is, but feel free to, to connect in here too. Uh, what are the grounds of discrimination? And that meaning like what, what area did it fall in? Was it tenancy? Was it access to service? Was it employment? Um, what area of the discrimination? Again, so was it related to my race, my gender, my disability, those kind of things? Now these other questions are the questions, then the, like, those are kind of some of the initial questions and then the Alberta Human Rights Complaint will have a whole area where you can just write. And when you write this section, these are the things you need to consider. So you're gonna talk about what happened for sure and kind of lay it out, but you're gonna talk about how did this impact you? Because when they don't see the impact in these complaints, it's hard for them to really understand it. So did it affect your mental health? Did you have to take stress leave? Um, all of these different pieces, like how did it impact you? Did that impact also into your family? How did you receive the differential treatment? How did that look like? Um, if you were, you know, an employee that was treated differently than everybody else, and what, what did that look like? Did everybody else get to go on a trip to Las Vegas and you were left behind? home? You know, like those, like really being able to be clear on like, this is how I was treated differently. Um, what evidence do you have? What other information can help you? Whether it's emails, whether it's like audio recordings, things like that. What can you do um, to make sure that you have evidence? Some of the times, and I know this is a bit awkward, um, but we can use our technology to document nowadays. Um, so for example, I was working on a case last year where this woman, and, and it's funny, because even though I, you could say maybe she was paranoid, she actually recorded every phone call, all the conversations related to her case. And she had such a strong case in the courts because she had all this stuff, which sometimes you think, oh, you know, why would I do that? Or it's a lot of burden. But if you're able to just kind of file it and put it away, it might be a good thing. Or if you're having a, a conversation with that person at your employment who is harassing you and not being um, great, record it. And this, I, I I feel like sneaky doing saying these things, but what you also need to understand is in Ca Alberta, Alberta is a one party consent in relation to recording. So I can be on a phone call and I can record that phone call without the other person knowing. Um, where this comes into really important place is particularly when it's public sector. Um, so say you're on the phone with a caseworker for child welfare or something, you're you have every right to record those phone calls so that's in alberta is it is a one party um consent uh i don't know about the other provinces but but here um we can do that um I just have a question and yeah sure so um first of all thank you for that information i i didn't know that but so let's say um it's a conversation not with someone in the public sector, but just a conversation um, uh, with a colleague or something where it's more of a, a yep. civilian conversation, I guess. Like it's not with your boss, it's not with like a, um, you know, any kind of entity. Yep. Um, you have like an obligation to let them know at least if you're going to use it in some kind of legal manner, like what's the obligation there? Uh, again, there, I mean, there's, there's ethics and then there's obligation. Um, there's no obligation to, to use that. Um, like you can use that um, in the courts. Uh, you can seek their consent, but there's no obligation to do so um, as a result of that. Okay. Well, Party consent. Yeah, it, it is interesting. It's something I've even learned uh, over the last year, which has been very interesting because I think we're all kind of afraid to do that. But in some ways, it can help us a lot. Um, 
yeah okay so then yeah. no thank you thanks for asking that um and then relation the other last piece about that you want to think about with your complaint when you're filing a complaint even though there's no space to to no specific question on this is you as the victim of the complaint should i hate that word victim so i just want to change it um you want to articulate what you want to see as an outcome. And this is really important because it will help the commission also be able to be clear on how they can support forward. So say you just file the complaint and there's there's nothing there in terms of what you want to see as an outcome. Maybe, maybe it's just money. Um, but sometimes it's about like, you know, maybe there's a business that you, it's a consistently a problem serving a, a specific clientele, for example. Um, you can give very specific action ideas about what you feel needs to be done to address the situation. It could be say, I want this store, whether it's Superstore or Red Apple or anywhere to take um, cultural awareness training. Uh, you can also kind of suggest other things that you want to see happen, but then you can also see, also articulate how it can be rectified for you. Um, and that's, that's a really kind of critical thing to articulate. So these are kind of the key kind of critical pieces around um, the complaint itself. And if you're able to answer all these questions, you will have a really solid complaint. And the trick is, the, the hardest thing is just really being able to show that differential treatment. I will say like, I know one of my colleagues who's a lawyer who used to work with the commission, he said he was always really heartbroken at how many complaints he would get around race, but how hard it is to, um, prove that um, and so how that really that burden of evidence and that articulation and the documentation is really important so what's troubling about that is it leaves people who are in challenging situations to um, continue in those and document what's happening um, but unfortunately that burden of evidence is what's really kind of critical as we move forward can so, i have a question yeah so in terms of the evidence, um, how we're treated differently from others, so let's say it's race, right? And I have one where like Ed is like, <laughs> we're totally treated differently because of our race. And I don't wanna say it's petty because it is racism. So there's a golf course near to us that wouldn't take our child, even riding, right? And we're Asians. Um, whereas a friend of ours, they're white and they've always had their children in the car, not they're not playing and they're welcomed, right? And um, it feels like it's racism, right? And and we don't go to that course anymore, even though it's 10 minutes away. And I don't want to say I'm petty, but in terms mm -hmm. of like, I could answer all the questions that you just um, yeah. raised, right? Um, but so let's say our friend who's white and we're using them as the benchmark, how come their kids can go and my kid can go? Do we need to ask them for permission or how can we use your name to say we're treated differently? Yes, you can provide like witnesses like or if somebody was there witnessed something, you can include them. Or um, in that case, you know, it might be about you could kind of, you don't have to name their names necessarily in the complaint itself, or although if they were open to making a statement that this is how, you know, what would be interesting from them is just a quick note or a letter or an email that you could attach that could say, you know, this is my situation with my children at this golf course. And then it just gives you a little bit of back backup, but um, you could file the complaint even without that evidence. It just, that evidence will give it that strength, a little bit more strength to help it go through. Because like I said, the commission gets like about 17,000 complaints a year. They're really looking for those easy ones to, to kick out. Um, so the more we can kind of have some of those pieces of evidence, that's great. And honestly, Grace, that, that is a really good one to submit because they are offering a public service. You know, it's, it's yeah. So that's interesting. I'm sorry to hear about that. So we have, we have a little bit more time, if you all want. I kind of finished the uh, kind of the formal presentation of the complaint process. And then like the next time we can kind of go into like, so what happens after the complaint? I don't feel, I don't feel fully prepared to dive into that today yet, unfortunately, um, but I'm happy. We'll do that again in two weeks as we'll come back and we'll dig into that one. And my hopes is actually to bring one of my colleagues, Armand, who um, worked with the Human Rights Commission, who can, can help inform 
that discussion because while I've filed complaints, I, you know, I help people file them, but once they're filed, they kind of go through the processes without me. So <laughs> it's uh, fun. But is, are there any other questions or even things that you want to talk about? Or, you know, if, even if you wanted to like share anything that we want to work through, we could do that. We've got a little bit of time. Otherwise we can, yeah, open it up. Uh, hi, I am Catherine. Uh, can I ask a question from uh, Rene about the human rights complaint? Um, like uh, there was a 12 month period time. Um, you know, uh, I was a uh, victim, but I was waiting until I was, uh, I am under union and uh, union asked me to not to file. They will, uh, you know, uh, resolve the problem. But the arbitration didn't take even after one year. Um, but my suggestion, like my, I am giving advice, yes. even if you have a union or if you have anything, it's really harm and it's really hurt you is better you file the human rights complaint. Yes. Then uh, at least you have that time period because I have uh, threatening, like the supervisor threatening me to kill me. Like, you know, she threatened me very badly. I cannot put it on my complaint because it's out of time. And she threatening for signature. I have evidence to prove that. And it's out of time period and they didn't accept it. And this make sure like my guideline for everybody is better even if you have a union or if the company say that they are compromising, doing everything, uh, arrange all, don't worry, don't trust it. Try to do your complaint before that uh, time period. That will help you to, uh, at least you have a complaint there, you can go further uh, for any other, you know, help. Yes. Thank you. That's so important, Catherine. Thank you for saying that. And I, I think maybe that's where I was like getting stuck about the union piece too, because it's like, there are often these internal mechanisms to solve problems for agencies, which we can use and we should use for sure. But don't wait on those to come to conclusion before you get your human rights complaint in because otherwise you will be hooped. And then it's also harder to articulate it and put it together a year down the road. So um, my suggestion is always just to get it in. There's no harm to get it in. And it, like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. And, you know, I, I think it's, it, yeah, I think, you know, there's, it just will get gears moving for you and unions I'm finding. And I, and I, I apologize if this sounds the wrong way, cause I just, I need to learn more about unions, but there are more and more cases coming to us, uh, where unions just are not working for the people. Um, that they're supposed to be serving. So we've really got to be careful. And it, I think it speaks to this idea around using mechanisms that aren't intertwined and connected to the agency or organization that you're complaining about. Um, I often find that even with like the policing, you know, I feel like we should be filing more to these independent spaces rather than to the police review spaces because it's internal. Yeah. So thank yeah, you. Sorry, sorry, Rania. Yeah. And even now, like last uh, um, uh, two months ago, the union phoned me back. I have two arbitration uh, hearing, um, but you know they're making a different timing, different uh, uh, between the company and the, between the union. And union asked me to. Uh, they are giving little bit force me, like uh, you know, they because I file it by myself. And mm -hmm. they know that I don't have anybody behind. And it's, when it's got to out, it's going to harm the company. And they want to keep quiet. They want me to keep quiet. They ask me, can you defer? And then we will work with your arbitration. You will get your job back, you know, and then we can solve the problem. And I say, it's too late. It's already it's three years. And I say, I told the person, I say, I'm so sorry. You, I can I record your, uh, um, you know, information to submit to the human rights, and then they hang up the phone. Mm -hmm. It's been like they want me to uh, give up. You know, they say that uh, because now the union and the company they still having difficulty negotiation to upgrade their um, agreement, mm -hmm. and they don't know they want to use my case to bring there to you know to cover up. But I told her no. I need the proper investigation and I need the justice. Mm -hmm. What they did to me, I need the result. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Is there any other questions or thoughts or? 
for contemplations. Me. Yeah. Um, just wanting to ask in terms of you know, these are really great information on the complaints, the tribunals, and well, what, what can we do to remedy the situation? But in terms of taking a step back and, you know, kind of wanting to advocate proactively um, to, let's say, you know, these issues we're talking about, right? Like um, human resources at unions, at uh, employment agencies, tenancy, things like that. Like in Alberta, what are some of the proactive activities that you know we can be part of in terms of educating you know um the people who are seem to be doing wrong to people right to act in a right manner um and to be taking you know rights in an important manner like what can we do to be proactive in that manner it's a good question i don't know if any of my colleagues want to jump in too or if anybody else has comments i'll, I'll go but feel free if anybody has anything to add but I think the thing that stands out to me, the one thing that was just jumping at me as you were talking was like the value and importance of human rights education is just yeah. like so critical and there's yeah. not a lot of groups doing it. Um, but I think there it's a connect, maybe connecting into the agencies that are starting to do that work and giving capacity. I think a lot of maybe groups that are doing maybe rights work, maybe they don't see it as rights work, maybe they're doing education work, they need forces behind them to push the education out a little bit more. I don't think there's, you know, education um, and awareness building, capacity building for those people who are the violators is very far, it's far, few and far between, to be honest. And um, so part of that, there's this piece about like really mobilizing around education and building campaign strategies with different allies and, and, and groups. But then there's this piece of starting to really uh, maybe submit these larger picture shadow reports and stuff to, mm -hmm. you know, when we, my, my thought is, is too, is like when, we, when and if we write a shadow report to a UN agency, we should mobilize and capitalize on that by building media strategies and education strategies around it as well. Like when I think about shadow reports that go in, but none of us ever know about, um, we can use those as ways to kind of apply pressure. So those are, I mean, that's a, it's a big question, Grace, I, I feel, but those are the two pieces that really stand out to me. I don't know if anybody else has anything that you have suggestions around that question. Sorry, Rani, I can add it. Um, I remember Susila, uh, a person Annie? she's from a human rights uh, trainer or teaching. Uh, yeah. She did, and uh, I went to class with uh, her term, and they're saying that there was an agreement under any companies, yeah. uh, they agreement and signed under human rights law. Mm -hmm. But those management supervisor or any uh, merchandiser, district manager, don't have any train or course with the human rights. They don't know the knowledge about what is the uh, mm -hmm. uh, employment rights, employer rights, employee rights. They don't know. They mm -hmm. sign the document, but they don't have education about it. I write under my case. They ask me what to expecting from human rights. I ask them, those people need to be trained for the human rights. No, they have to learn what is the uh, like employees law and employer law. Under those uh, circumstances, sentence, they have to learn and they have to respect for the human rights law. That's what I ask them to do for uh, any company, not only the company I face the, uh, I file the case, every company, they sign for the documents right under human rights law. So to, to build on that, to add on that, um, to give some context. So Sheila is no longer with the Human Rights Commission and yeah. the resources within the commission have been totally reduced and um, they don't even have people doing training anymore. So while they're supposed to be an access point for employment to be able to get that education, they don't really have the capacity. Um, so then I kind of think it kind of comes again to this idea that we really need to be building that education and driving it forward together. So there is that law and they're obligated, but there's no resources to get that support. So I just want to kind of address the chat here. Um, there's a question about like, so if I understand this correctly, uh, the protected areas apply to all corporations or businesses that offer public services, even small private restaurants, for example. Absolutely. Yes, 100%. Even if it's that small little restaurant in Fort McLeod, Alberta, um, that kicked out certain people. I'm sure if Melly's on, she's reminding, I'm reminding her of all the things we've been working on. They are, they are obligated. No matter if we're offering a public service, you are obligated. Um, 
Chris that mentioned the disability movement did not know about the shadow report. It'd be interesting, Chris, to really look and dig into the shadow reporting and, and build a bit of a cross provincial thing. I know there's a lot of people in Saskatchewan keen on that. And then Gurpreet writes, a lot of people don't have any knowledge about human rights and how to deal with complaints. Yes, especially in the younger generations, the way to deal with it now has been online posting of Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook, and even problematic doxing. I don't know about other volunteers, but I would definitely be pushing for social media community advocates. Gurpreet, this is news to my ears. I've been actually thinking a lot about how we need to build advocates, like social media troll advocates, like that are going on and nudging but also kind of helping respond to things. I know the team down in Lethbridge has been really uh, great at doing that. They kind of monitor and watch Facebook and they tag it or they report it to like the hate crimes committee if they feel like it need, crosses lines. So I think I agree. I feel like there's such a need to build like an army, a force online that is like a positive force rather than that. And to support people because people are are are, are, are doing this outlet but um, we need to be able to support people and feel like it moves beyond the social media. So I thank you for that. That's a really, that's yeah. really great. That's definitely like what I see now, like with the like human rights and stuff, what actually pushed me to volunteer here is that I saw tons and tons of posts about like Black Lives Matter, um, Indigenous issues, stuff like that. But people wanted to help, but they didn't know the proper way of doing so. And posting can only go so far, right? Like it can go towards like emails and stuff like that. But when it becomes like problematic i feel like we need like a force of like people that are like there like on social media and they don't sound like super professional like they can communicate to whoever they want to communicate with and like i would definitely be interested in like having like a volunteer like group of like people that are social media savvy and they'll be able to deal with that kind of stuff people that have the training well i think we have to go out well, i think we should evolve that i agree <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good all right, any other kind of questions or comments before we wrap up? Um, I have uh, two questions, if that's yeah. okay. Um, so my first question is, um, so in terms of the cases that we'll be getting, I'm just wondering how frequently um, would, um, do we file a complaint? So like, I guess I'm just thinking like, let's say someone comes to you with like a housing issue and um, like, let's say their landlord is treating them very unfairly because of, you know, whatever reason, let's say they're they're just um, not a great landlord or um, wanting to get this person out, whatever it is. Um, and so I'm just using an example because I, I'm familiar with that sort of thing. So let's say, you know, in that case, you, you know, I, I'm just thinking in terms of myself, like I would go to the Residen Residential Tenancies Act, like, you know, see what resources are available, you know, maybe write a letter to mm -hmm. the landlord explaining like, like xyz like this is why you can't do this because this is yep. the act or whatever and then let's say that gets resolved and let's say the landlord goes oh, okay shoot like i can't do that like fine mm -hmm. fine like i'm like it's fine so the situation would be resolved there so how often is it sort of like the situation resolves in that way versus like okay well now we have to take this to you know a human rights violation and like a complaint like so i guess i'm just wondering like how often does it go down like either um either stream Good question. I, I guess I'm going to say like maybe about 50% of the time. I, I, like I, maybe it's a good guess. Like it's, I think a lot of the times we're like kind of like what you're suggesting is like we always want to kind of go through these processes first. Like write a letter to to that the the culprit <laughs> yeah. so that they know that they can raise awareness. You know, like for example, we have one agency in Edmonton that we've been having a lot of complaints about. So we wrote a letter to all their board members as a starting point so that we can start this process. And like, even with the complaints we had in Slave Lake, we started with like, okay, let's file it. Let's file it to the Alberta Health Advocate first. Let's file it to Alberta Health Services so they know they have a chance to respond. Um, if they don't, then it all goes into the commission. So we're kind of, yeah, right. trying to phase that approach. And a lot of times people don't want to file a complaint, which is fine. Um, I think we're, we want to, that you know, the part about the stride effort too is to be able to not necessarily everything will go into complaints but the data that we are working to collect to show back to the provincial government or different levels of government about what's actually happening to people is so important so i think yeah it goes kind of through that that phase of points of contact but keeping in mind the year thing but a lot of times it's very it's things that are people don't want to file a complaint maybe they just want 
a letter uh, you know there's like so many different ways yeah to well I remember you saying head. last time like you were saying how it's up to the person like we'll draft it or whatever and then it's up to them to send it like if they want to but if they yeah don't, yeah that's their choice right so, yeah okay awesome. are, yeah for structure of seeing is that many cases are even if they don't go what I so just let me back up. What we see in the cases is that the complexity doesn't lie on they wanting to file a human rights complaint. It's like the intersections of the amount of um, barriers that people are facing. So it's not, is perhaps on um, the situation of the apartment is complicated by the fact that the person has um, a disability or and is, I don't know, isolated. And so there is much more than, than just writing one letter. There, it's usually the complexity lies in the amount of um, oppression that these pe people are facing and they're coming to us as the last kind of resource. Thank you. Um, sorry, I have uh, two <laughs> questions. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, no, this uh, is good. My, my second question is, um, <laughs> so a lot of these resources are awesome, like the slideshows and stuff. Are they available for us to access afterwards just so yes. we can take even the things you told us to reference and stuff like they'll be available? Yeah. Okay. What I'll do is I'm going to send you, an, I will send you an email and I have, it'll have a link to a Google folder. And in that Google folder, it'll have uh, the three levels of complaint system and all the relevant documents associated with them. Um, and then also like this, this, so we'll send you a, yeah, a Google folder, which then you can kind of keep and we keep up to date with like the different complaint uh, forms and stuff like that. So we'll follow up and send that to you following this yeah and then this will this with the recording we'll throw it up on the youtube as well just so people can access it and have a look at it awesome awesome so last question i'm sorry uh so for the um this is more of a logistical question i guess so i i've been trying to fight or to uh, obtain the police information check for the vulnerable sectors check i keep getting to i don't know if anyone else is having this issue but i keep getting to this point where they I'm want listening. me to, to upload a pdf file um, with a letter from the organization. Okay. Um, and I've, I've never had to do that before. Like I've, I've, I've gotten- Can you write too? Yes. Okay, yeah. um, Thank you. So, and it won't and let me part? pass that page, I guess, I can um, without uploading something. So I'm not sure uh, if anyone else has run into this uh, while trying to file online, because that's how they're doing it at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I can answer that. Sorry, I just- um, I just did it yesterday and it was really fast. All I did was the first email when I had signed up for the volunteer to volunteer. I had gotten a response and I just kind of took a picture of it. Ah, smart. Oh, okay, great. So can I, okay. So if I screenshot like the email, like, is that sufficient? That's, that's good. Yeah. And it was really oh, fast. It was within hours. I got a response back. from. Oh, yeah. amazing. great. That was fast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And he wrote a letter and we will have a letter for you if you want one, then we will have letters um, testing that you are wanting to volunteer with us. Okay. Uh, no, you know what, if someone did it with the email and it worked, then I will just do that. I was just wondering, yeah. like, yeah. I'm trying to do it as soon as I can. And um, like, I was hoping you would let me bypass that page, but it won't. And so, yeah. Um, thank you so much for whoever um, answered that question there. Thank you. Did you say Jasmine? Jasmine or Jasmine? Yeah, Jasmine. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much for that. All right. Um, one more question on the vulnerable check. So I've done it probably four or five years ago. Is it um, still standing or it's a one year kind of thing? It's usually a one year. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. okay. We'll redo. Thank you. Keith, I'm wondering, do you want to talk to this point that you've put in the chat to, so we can all? He says, sometimes not filing is structural. Looking into areas that aren't even obvious, relations can be part of the part, part of the part holding people back, yes. Including experience of denial and disability and not even being treated as a person, yes. Do you want to so say I'm more? Not necessarily saying this is like, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, I'm not necessarily saying this all from like, um, areas that's going to re relate with everybody in the disability community, but I definitely noticed, especially with some circumstances on my own, and some of other folks in the disability community, when they want to bring up a uh, human rights complaint, they may get into like areas where they start feeling they may end up having the confidence to maybe like uh, 
address the issue. But for example, like coming into the Alberta Human Rights Commission or going into certain areas like that. I mean, like I know organizations that I still get involved with today that if we end up coming in and they we define that one person coming in as an ally and then two people are gonna be coming in as people with disabilities, it doesn't matter how any of us who are labeled as disabled uh, talk or uh, present ourselves. Often, I've noticed that the person who ends up being labeled as the ally gets more of the recognition, which that in itself can already make a person feel like ridiculously uncomfortable with actually bringing up about their issues because they already have enough things in their lives that are already making them feel like I'm Shit. less of a person. And uh, the when they're finally bringing it to a place where they're thinking that something can actually go somewhat better. I mean, like, I know people in the community who just won't even go, period, just simply because they've had enough experience with enough other areas where maybe at some point they had some hope that it was going to go somewhere and enough times that they got uh, shoved to the side and then, or that they went with an ally and all of a sudden the other person is only paying attention to the ally, no matter what they're saying, that it's just like, it, it dehumanizes. And mm -hmm. I mean, like, I know that several other communities go through similar experiences with that. And that sometimes uh, part of the larger problem is it's not necessarily calling up forms. It's not necessarily yeah. like wanting to bring up the issue. It's like being even treated as a human while going through that process. Yes. That's, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's huge, I think. And it's interesting because yeah. it makes me think about, you know, yeah, people who go in and act as a, a witness or a, to something and how that can, while it can help, it may also, that's an interesting, I don't know if there's any solutions around that or, or thoughts, but it's definitely something for us to kind of contemplate on, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Heath. Okay, well, it seems like we've kind of feeling feel like we've come to a to an end. I, you know, I think I, I, I just love the fact, Diana, and thanks for asking questions and stuff and grace and that like we're, I guess part of stride is getting to know each other and um, building a network and it's weird because being online, I just it feels so weird, you know, we were always together in 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 person, uh, doing these sessions and um, And so it's hard to make those connects. So I really appreciate the desire to engage in this space and ask the questions so we can kind of come in and build and learn because and i want to say you know that 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 quote at the beginning from mouse horton we make the road by walking one of the things i want to say about stride is we're just figuring this all out we're doing this because we see the gap and we're trying to build forward and all of us in this journey will kind of help inform and define what it what it looks like and i just really appreciate all of you being willing to do this um because I think as a result of this, I'm starting to see a confidence in different groups in starting to come forward and express their voice and feel like somebody is actually listening to them. Um, you know, and some of the complaints I feel really have been good. And it kind of like what Gurpreet was saying about this, the online stuff is some of the most serious issues and complaints I see are being posted on Facebook, but they're left there. Um, and there was one we worked on with the UVA uh, last, I put it together in November, and it was of a community that would never normally file. And they're filing and they're speaking out and they're confident about it. And it's because we were listening. And when we support each other, I think it makes a huge difference. So so I, yeah, thank you for coming today. And um, yeah, next time we'll dig into processes and we'll just keep building and growing together and, and uh, support the community. And let's, let's uh, yeah. Angelica, is there anything else you want to say here? <laughs> One last comment on the chat box. So Chantal is telling us that there's a free movie on Google Play right now that is called The Hate You Give. Um, so that will be, she's suggesting us to watch that. So it will be. Thank you for your input. No, I don't have any, anything else to say. I'm just looking forward to keep working with you. I think the training, this approach of like short sessions that we really deep um, into topics is, I think it's, is really worth it. And, and it's sad we cannot sit and share food and um, have side conversations, but we, we will.
when it comes. <laughs> well, and I just noticed the, some private chat around just not quite feeling confident yet. I think if there's a complaint or maybe an issue that you want to dig into, maybe that is something that we, you know, send me a note and maybe we start to just evolve a conversation with a team of us around uh, that issue and we can start to build it forward together. Because it was funny because somebody from the last session was from Saskatchewan and was talking about disability stuff and what they would, the fact that they are really feel they've hit every barrier. They've went, they've tried the commissions, they've tried all these things. So they want to do shadow reporting. They want to report to the UN. So, um, you know, we can start to build teams around these things to move them forward too. So I just want to leave it at that. So thank you all. And um, we'll see you over the, over the airwaves or in person sometime. <laughs> July 2nd, I think is the next one. Okay. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Much love. <laughs> Thank you, Rani. You're thank very you welcome, Patrick. Thank, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Keep Bye. running. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Take care. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chantal. It's good to see you. Well, hear you. Sorry. There I am. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. We'll see okay. you. Bye bye. Take care. Take care too, Chantal.